is Diagnosis Glaucoma with your hosts, Dr. Mona Colleen and Dr. Harry Quigley. Hello, and welcome back to this episode of Diagnosis Glaucoma. Today, we have a very special guest, and the topic is a special request from one of our listeners. We'll be talking about dry eye and how it can impact glaucoma. Our guest today is one of my colleagues at the Wilmer Eye Institute, Dr. Anissa Geary. Dr. Geary, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Thank you so much for having me on your podcast today, Dr. Colleen. I've been an optometrist at Wilmer since 2012, and I currently practice at the Bethesda location. And I became interested in dry eye following graduation when I began fitting a device called PROSE, P-R-O-S-E, which stands for the Prosthetic Replacement of the Ocular Surface Ecosystem. And it's a device that we use in treating severe dry eye. So can you actually tell us a little bit more about that PROSE lens you just mentioned? So the PROSE device is a device that sits on the white part of the eye, which is the sclera. It doesn't touch the cornea any place, and inside of it, we fill it with a non-preserved saline solution. So that saline is constantly bathing the eye. So we use these in many patients with systemic dry eye related to Sjogren's disease, rheumatoid arthritis, patients with exposure keratopathy, so a wide variety of conditions where we basically need to have really good coverage of the cornea throughout the day. And is it something specific for people with dry eye? So there are two types of patients that usually benefit from PROSE. Half of the patients are dry eye patients, and then the other half of the patients are patients that have irregular corneas, and that can be related to diseases such as keratoconus, or after they've had corneal transplant, or scarring from uh, disease or injury. Okay, here's maybe a hard question. Can you have a PROSE lens put on your eye after you've had a glaucoma surgery, like a trabeculectomy or a tube shunt? That's a really interesting question. So it really depends on where the tube shunt or the bleb is. And sometimes we can go past it and we can make little channels around it. Sometimes if it's very elevated, then I'll have to go to a different type of lens. So I just want to kind of recap what you said about the PROSE lens, which is used to treat dry eye and also astigmatism. And well, it depends on someone's eye if they've had surgery, but where the surgery was will determine whether they can have the PROSE lens, but they are still candidates for it. That's correct. Very nice. I did not know that. So we've kind of bypassed what actually dry eye is. Some people may not know what it is. Can you just describe what dry eye is in general and then maybe go into more information about how glaucoma patients are at greater risk for getting dry eye? So dry eye is a chronic inflammatory disease, which is primarily caused by the poor quality of tears or poor quantity of tears. The tear layer consists of three basic layers. So there's an outermost thin lipid layer that's created by the meibomian glands. There's a main aqueous layer, which is created by your accessory glands and your lacrimal gland, and then an innermost mucin layer, which is created by the goblet cells. And these goblet cells are really important because they get impacted in a lot of the glaucoma medications. The goblet cells are responsible for helping your tears spread, so surface tension, and then also the viscosity of your tears, so how long the tears last in your eyes. And in glaucoma patients, some studies have shown that dry eye can exist in up to 49 to 59% of glaucoma patients that are using topical glaucoma medications. And that may be as a result of increasing age, other systemic conditions that are also going on. That's quite a lot of dry eye. Now I'm thinking about, as I put people on eye drops, things I recommend for them. So I think if someone is prone to dry eye from some of those other factors you mentioned, it might actually lead me to think about what medication I'm going to put them on, or if maybe they should have a laser or a surgery. And actually dry eye sounds really complex, like all of the little glands that you just mentioned in the cells. It's not just one thing that can cause the dry eye. I've also heard that there are certain medications we take by mouth for systemic conditions or diseases that can cause dry eye. Do you run into patients with those types of issues also? Yes. So some patients that are on allergy medications, those can cause dry eye. There are a number of medications for anxiety or depression that can result in increased dryness. For women going through menopause, there are changes in hormone and their tear productions as well. How common is dry eye in general? 
So it ranges in various populations, but anywhere between 30 to 40 percent of the patient in America can present with dry eye. So about 30 to 40 percent, and then amongst people with glaucoma, maybe as high as 50 to 60 percent. Right. What are some of the symptoms of dry eye? Like, how can someone recognize this? So some of the most common symptoms that a patient presents with are burning and stinging, a change in their vision. So the vision is not stable throughout the day. It constantly is changing. Some eye pain can be present. Those are some of the most common ways. And we can use different questionnaires that are validated questionnaires like the Ocular Surface Disease Index or the NEI VFQ25 to really get an assessment of how this affects the quality of life for the patient. Can patients find that information online, or is that something that they have to talk to their eye doctor about? These questionnaires are available online, and there are many more. And sometimes, even if we don't do a formal questionnaire, we can ask patients in the office, how is their vision throughout the day? Do they have any eye pain? Do their eyes burn or sting? Those are some things that can be just discussed in the office. And what about, like, is there any testing in the office? There are a wide variety of tests that we can do in the office, starting with measuring tear production. So we can use these little strips of paper to see how much tears are produced by a patient. We can check the saltiness of the tears, which is the osmolarity. Behind the slit lamp, we can put different dyes in the patient's eye to stain the cornea and the conjunctiva, and then look at and grade the dryness. There are Lots of other tests, like looking at just the blink of a patient, if the blink is complete, um, if they're closing their eyes properly, and then examining the eyelids, making sure if the lids look thickened or red or inflamed, and then expressing the meibomian glands. So seeing what comes out of those meibomian glands, if that secretion is thick or opaque or there's no secretion at all. I do want to mention that if you want to get this kind of testing done, you should seek out a dry eye specialist in your area. I, as a glaucoma specialist, don't routinely check for these things, but I think that, again, if you want to get this testing done, then call your local eye doctor and find out if they treat and measure dry eye. So, Anissa, for people who maybe don't have the chance to get in and get the dry eye testing done quite yet, Are there preventative measures that they can try at home before they come in to see the doctor? So there are definitely some lifestyle modifications that can be made. Um, So many patients right now are working from home. So it's important when you're working on the screen to take frequent breaks. The rule of thumb is for every 20 minutes that you're on the computer, you should be looking away in the distance for 20 seconds. That allows your eyes to relax and blink fully. You can use preservative-free artificial tears that are available over the counter. Those are the tears that come in those individual vials. They have no preservatives in them, and those can be used three or four times during the day, especially if you notice a big change in your vision as you're on the computer or reading all day, the vision gets worse. I've seen coupons online for the artificial tears, especially the preservative-free ones, which tend to be a little bit more expensive. So if you go online, you can simply just search on the web and find coupons, or I often find the preservative-free artificial tears in some of the warehouse-type stores, and they do tend to be less expensive than in a general pharmacy. Are there any other places that you recommend getting these eye drops for maybe a reduced cost? The warehouse stores are usually where most patients find the best prices on these. And each vial is usually has multiple drops in there, and they're good for up to 24 hours. And some of them are recapable. So like the Refresh Plus, you can put the head back on and use it throughout the day. All right. And so another question for you, Dr. Geary. Are there things in your diet and lifestyle that you can do to prevent or to treat dry eye? So diet-wise, we know that the omega-3 and omega-6 are helpful in treating patients who have meibomian gland dysfunction, and those can be taken as an oral supplement or included in the diet. The other things to think about are sleeping. When you're sleeping, if you have like overhead fans or air vents to try to redirect the air or not sleep with a fan. So those are just sort of environmental modifications that can be made. I've also heard people talk about using a humidifier. Do you agree with that? I do find that that is very helpful, especially when patients are working on the computer and they have very severe dry. If they can keep a personal humidifier next to them, it seems to be, it seems to be helpful. 
Now, when we talk specifically about glaucoma patients, what is it that you think makes them, as a population in particular, more prone to dry eye? And how can glaucoma patients treat their dry eye? Is it different from the other measures you just mentioned? So glaucoma patients would also treat their dry eye in sort of the same stepwise fashion that we treat dry eye in other patients. And normally when we assess the patient, we'll take a look at the dry eye and see, is this happening more because we are not making enough tears or is it that your tears are not lasting as long? And the baseline treatment usually is using artificial tears. There are many variety of types available. So you want to make sure you're using the right one because they do have different mechanisms of action. And after using those tears, we can escalate things by using medications that are prescription medications like Restasis or Zydra, Sequa. Those medications help control the inflammatory cascade of dry eye. We can put plugs in patients' eyes, and these basically are used to keep the tears in the eyes for a longer period of time. And there are treatments that we can do in the office for patients that have meibomian gland dysfunction, where we can help express some of that meibom in the office. And also we do preservative-free glaucoma medications, which are nice. There's preservative-free COSOPT, and there's also a preservative-free version of prostaglandin analog, which is one of the drops that's used at night. And I generally find that if patients have dryness of their eyes or are allergic to the preservative, that's in the other medications that if we put them on preservative-free glaucoma medications, they tend to like those better. So Dr. Geary, is there anything else you can share with our listeners about dry eye and glaucoma? I think one of the really important things is to share with your glaucoma care provider if you are having any of the symptoms that we discussed earlier. So if you are experiencing burning, stinging, fluctuating vision, because these are things that can be treated and can be treated early. And we know from different studies that when a patient starts to feel better, they may be more compliant with their glaucoma medication and the end result would be better eye pressure control. Are you doing any research or work in this area? I am working to try to obtain some of the thermal pulsation treatments in our office in Bethesda for the meibomian gland dysfunction patients, and I also work with our Sjogren Center at the Bayview Hospital. I think our listeners are really excited about this topic and to hear you give this advice If they want to support your research or even come visit you in the clinic, well, first of all, how can they support your work? Do you have a development officer's information you can share with them? And then also, how can they make appointments with you? So my development officer, her name is Lindsay Rogers. And to make an appointment with me, you can call our Bethesda office, 240-482-1100. And I'm in clinic all week. So how can the listeners contact Lindsay Rogers? So Lindsay's email is l. R-O-G-E-R 27 at J-H-M-I dot E-D-U. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode. I appreciate it. Thanks, Mona. Thanks to all of you for joining us, and we will be with you then next time. Thank you for joining us. Until next time, your mom says take your drops.